Hello, my name is John Stoltz, Director of Conferences and Events for APEX, and I will be your host for today's webinar, E-Commerce Supply Chain Challenges in 2018. Before we begin, I'd like to run through a few logistical details with you. We have time planned for a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. If you look at the right toolbar on your screen, you'll see a question box. At any time during the presentation, simply type your question in the designated box and select Send Question to send this on for a review. For today's webinar, I'm joined by Dimitri Antonov. Dimitri is the Vice President of Domestic Product Management at DHL eCommerce Americas. He and his team focus on developing and enhancing the U.S. domestic portfolio, product portfolio to provide the best match for the needs of the e-commerce sector. Prior to joining DHL eCommerce, Dimitri was an associate partner with DHL Consulting, leading the global retail sector practice and specifically focusing on omni-channel model development. Dimitri's presentation content today was also featured at the APEX 2017 conference last year in San Antonio. The APEX annual conference is a premier supply chain conference featuring exceptional educational content covering the end-to-end -end supply chain and world-class speakers from some of the world's leading organizations. We are also very pleased to share that APEX 2018 will feature another DHL presenter, Christophe Lutelier, Regional Customer Director of Retail and Consumer at DHL, will be joining us for APEX 2018 in Chicago with an all-new educational session on how customer demands are reshaping last mile delivery. We're delighted to share such exceptional insights and learnings with the APEX community, and it is now my pleasure to present Dimitri. Thank you, John. Um, before we jump to the topic of the conversation, uh, just a couple of um, words about the company that uh, I work for. We're just joking uh, behind the scenes that uh, everybody is aware uh, about uh, DHL um, exit from the US market many years back. And uh, what we realized when we go to the conference that some people don't even know that we still are present in the domestic delivery segment. So DHL e-commerce is a, a branch of DHL which specializes on e-commerce um, sector needs uh, in terms of the delivery. Uh, in the US, we operate in three uh, segments, which is a domestic delivery, that's the B2C residential delivery of packages. We also uh, are present in cross-border de delivery, which is the export from the US uh, globally. Uh, and the third segment is the fulfillment, uh, where we operate a network of uh, warehouses and do single order uh, e-commerce fulfillment. In uh, the last year, we processed uh, almost half a billion packages. We operate a network of 19 distribution centers in the U.S., and we employ more than 4,000 people uh, here in the U.S. Uh, my job title is uh, the head of product management, and in my role, I spend a lot of time thinking about e-commerce to make sure that um, our service offering uh, really uh, fits to the needs of uh, e-commerce sector. Uh, and uh, when I think about e-commerce, I'm actually getting really excited uh, because I believe uh, this is a very exciting topic and it goes far beyond uh, just pure act of purchasing something online and then getting it delivered to your house. But it creates fundamentally new uh, opportunities for us as uh, shoppers or as human beings. It also creates fundamentally new opportunities for businesses and uh, uh, has um, a very um, important implications of, of, on supply chains uh, and it's actually making supply chains a very cool profession to be in again. Um, so today I'm not going to jump right into the discussion of e-commerce supply chains but I'm going to start a little bit far uh, so I would like us to reflect about the meaning of e-commerce uh, for us and for our businesses then talk about uh, the implications for supply chains and at the other presentation um, I will also spend some time uh, talking about some lessons that we've learned um, along um, when working with our customers on this topic of e-commerce supply chain transformations. So what is the opportunity, right? Uh, we uh, just are out of another Prime Day sales event by Amazon, and um, although the numbers are not out yet, uh, but uh, some indications show that it was yet another um, e-commerce record uh, sales day. Uh, and the commerce uh, keeps growing. Uh, the opportunity is estimated to be $3.4 trillion uh, by the year 2020, which is uh, uh, one and a half years out from now, right? Uh, if you're like me and you get lost in zeros uh, when you talk about trillions, 
uh, 3.4 trillion is actually the GDP of Germany, which is the fourth largest economy in the world. So just think about it, right? Uh, one sector uh, is as big as the GDP of the fourth largest economy in the world. Despite this huge number, uh, when you talk to the executives, uh, there is still some skepticism about e-commerce as an opportunity. Uh, and uh, rightfully so, uh, usually uh, it has three components to that. So the first component is that uh, despite the huge size of e-commerce, it still remains uh, uh, just a little bit more than 15% of US uh, retail in total, right? So it's a significantly smaller portion compared to offline sales. The second argument is that basically e-commerce is a lot about hype at the moment. And uh, when you look at the uh, e-commerce growth curve, right? So the question, the rightful question is, uh, if we project uh, uh, the growth into the future, where are we right now on this curve? Are we more on the left side where, you know, e-commerce is just about to take off or are we more on uh, kind of like the right side uh, where we're going to see the e-commerce growth fading out very soon. And this is a very important question for us to understand because depending on the answer, uh, we basically have to um, come up with different investment strategies, right? Uh, and the argumentation line sometimes says that, yeah, e-commerce is going to reach 20%, uh, but it's not going to pass beyond that mark, right? So we're going to see uh, in this presentation uh, whether uh, it's true or not. And the third argumentation line or the third component to this skepticism is usually that e-commerce is not going to impact uh, our business. So let's take a look what is really happening in the world. Uh, so this is uh, the e-commerce growth projected over the past um, six years. Uh, over here we have, right? Uh, and um, one thing to note is that the e-commerce growth, uh, when you think about that curve on the previous slide, it wasn't actually slowing down, but instead, uh, over the last couple of years, it was accelerating. The other interesting thing to note about um, this graph is uh, at the bottom line, uh, you see the growth forecast, which was created in 2012. And if you take the growth forecast from 2013, 14, 15 onwards, you will see a very similar picture. So every single year, uh, e-commerce growth is forecasted to start fading out, uh, but every single year the e-commerce growth exceeds the expectation of those forecasts so despite the projections that is going to start fading uh, the e-commerce growth at the moment what we're seeing is actually accelerating now the question how is that possible uh, why did e-commerce manage to beat the forecasts which are done by uh, scientists uh, by data scientists right uh, it um, uh, managed to beat the forecast almost every single year so obviously the e-commerce companies are doing something right in this world. And um, to understand that, we really need to think about the meaning of e-commerce uh, for us as consumers, right? So the e-commerce journey started really uh, with a price story. So if you think about e-commerce version uh, 10 or 15 years ago, it was really the price driven. So people would go online uh, uh, to buy something uh, as long as it was cheaper than buying it in the store, right? So it was kind of like a way for us to save money. It still remains uh, truth partially, although of course uh, those of you who shop on Amazon uh, already know that Amazon doesn't offer anymore the cheapest prices. Sometimes it's actually cheaper to, to go to your uh, closest retail store and get it a couple of cents cheaper than on Amazon. But generally this is still accurate because uh, one thing that e-commerce does, it creates the full price transparency across uh, different merchants, right? And it creates almost like this type of per perfect competition um, uh, on price. Um, since then, e-commerce moved on a lot and um, people uh, use it for other purposes than just trying to get goods online for a cheaper price. So here's an example, South Korea. It's a nation with one of the longest working hours and it's also a nation where people uh, don't like um, doing weekly grocery shopping, but they like to buy fresh products every single day, right? In 2011, so already uh, seven years ago, Tesco launched an experiment uh, in the subway uh, where uh, they put images of, um, of the shelves of the grocery uh, stores um, uh, and enabled people uh, by using their handheld device and the QR code uh, to put items into the grocery cart uh, and uh, get them delivered to their house. And this was all possible to do uh, while they are on the commute back home from work. 
there was a huge success uh, in South Korea and after uh, the introduction on the first uh, subway station, um, they in the next year they rolled it out in a number of more um, uh, other stations. The orders usually get delivered the same day to your house. And if you think about it, why people gravitate to that? Well, obviously, because instead of spending uh, half an hour or an hour long in a grocery store every single day, if you want to get your products fresh, uh, people now can spend time, for instance, at home with their kids, or they can uh, spend time on working on their hobbies. Uh, so convenience is a very important factor uh, that uh, kind of uh, comes together with the commerce and enables us to just use time in a better way uh, rather than spending it on, on grocery shopping every single day. Another important thing to note when we talk about convenience is the data. Uh, one problem uh, with just uh, the traditional shopping uh, in brick and mortar stores, right, is that uh, normally when you go there, you don't care about 95% of items that are present uh, in the store, right? Uh, but you still have to work your way through the aisles to find this other 5% that you actually came there for. And uh, that is valid both for um, if you do your regular shopping or uh, when you do a discovery of products, it can be very very tiring, uh, frankly speaking. So this problem doesn't really exist online because online uh, the offering can be uh, completely personalized to your needs. And uh, on this picture is an example, a uh, very recent example. So it was, I think, launched just last week um, of a Nike store. Um, this is, a, I, I believe it's a very cool example of how Nike is actually using online data uh, to even form their uh, offline store assortment. So besides uh, featuring things like screens and all other e-commerce stuff in that store, one thing that they're doing differently is that they're using the e-commerce shopping data uh, and orders to form assortment which is offered in this offline store. So the store is located in Los Angeles, California, and they're using the shoppers, e-commerce shoppers data along, around that store to identify which items are most in demand. And then they uh, create inventory of these items in the store. So that even when you go into the store, you see the items that you actually care about rather than 100% um, of assortment that is out there. Um, their competitor, Adidas, uh, launched a couple of years ago a concept uh, which is called the virtual wall in the stores, right? Um, so what this virtual wall does, it, it is placed um, in the store near the aisles featuring the real products and it provides pictures, a full-size picture of uh, Adidas shoes, uh, which you can click on, you can rotate them, you can also read the product description about them. So what is really the meaning of this thing? Well, the meaning of this thing is that um, it enables uh, even the smallest Adidas stores to basically carry 100% uh, of Adidas inventory, which would have not, never been possible in a traditional store model, right? Where you have to uh, uh, create your SKU forecast and you uh, are very familiar with the long tail problem. Uh, so uh, by placing this, uh, virtual wall screens uh, in the store, Adidas can actually uh, carry the entire long tail of inventory uh, and enable consumers to uh, purchase um, all these uh, variable SKU products uh, right in the store and then get them delivered to their house online. And if you still cannot find the product that you are looking for in the store, you can go on Adidas website and um, you can configure the product to your needs. So here's an example of a shoe uh, that you can put together by selecting different color of um, uh, of the shoe, of the laces, um, different pattern, um, and make it 100% individualized. Uh, that is something uh, what traditional retail would have struggled with, having uh, having this long tail of SKUs. And this is um, the availability uh, is um, one of the things that is driving uh, the e-commerce growth. Uh, what is also important to note is that it's probably uh, the top reason for the growth of e-commerce in the rural areas. So when, when we think normally about e-commerce, we think about big cities, right? But uh, statistics shows that uh, in the past years, um, the highest growth rates uh, of e-commerce were actually seen in the rural areas, not only in the, in the US, but also uh, globally. And uh, the main driver behind is that people living in these rural areas just simply don't have access to the variety of products that um, uh, citizens from big cities um, do have. 
and last but not least technology uh, so one thing to note about e-commerce or the skeptics about e-commerce um, usually mention that um, uh, where e-commerce doesn't do such a good job is um, uh, our ability to touch and feel a product physically, right? And technology is coming up with new solutions to help completely overcome these barriers uh, of um, and to uh, enable a really new shopping experience in e-commerce. On the left side, you can see uh, an example of a recently launched uh, application by M. Taylor. Um, so you can use your tablet or your smartphone to take a measurement uh, of your body and to create a custom uh, tailored shirt for yourself. And they claim that this measurement is going to be even more accurate than a professional tailor would do, right? Or on the right hand side, uh, that's an example of augmented reality where e-commerce uh, or this technology maybe is doing even a better job than a physical store. Uh, because when you go to a, to a store and you, you want to select a couch for yourself, right? So you, of course, can touch the couch. You can sit on the couch, how comfortable it is. But one thing you cannot do about that is that you cannot place that couch in your room where you actually want to place it and to see what it looks like. And the users of this app um, actually can do that. And they claim that it, it looks so real. Uh, they can walk around it, uh, look at it from different angles uh, so that you, you, you can always swear that uh, the couch is physically uh, present in there. Another amplifier of e-commerce growth uh, worth mentioning here is the demographic shift. Um, in 2016, uh, a milestone was reached that millennials, uh, which is the digital native generation, uh, became the uh, largest generation, largest living generation in the United States. It's also the generation which has now most purchasing power uh, and is closely followed by Gen Z uh, behind. Uh, millennials were also the first adopters uh, as, of e-commerce as digital natives, uh, and they created kind of like this uh, mass adoption effect. And uh, in recent years, uh, baby boomers and so previous generations they started um, adopting e-commerce as well, mostly driven by the millennials. But so the important thing is that uh, the demographic shift naturally also creates the acceleration of e-commerce growth. Now the question is, uh, what does it all mean for our business? So hopefully by now I kind of I painted a picture a little bit that e-commerce uh, is accelerating. Uh, it's unlikely that we're going to see a fading um, growth rate of e-commerce anytime soon. And the technological advancement and demographic shifts um, are going to contribute to the accelerating growth of e-commerce. But the, but the big, big question is, uh, what does it all mean for our business, right? So not all of us are in retail. Why do we need to care about e-commerce? Well, because it creates um, very a number of very important business implications. The first one is cross-border e-commerce. It's coming from, a, it was enabled by the marketplaces and it's coming from a simple fact uh, that you can place right now your product online and you can make it available anywhere globally you want. Um, and uh, this creates a huge opportunity for companies uh, to uh, export products to other countries. Um, so good news here is that if you um, are a small company, a small business which wants to expand globally, you can do it uh, relatively easily. The bad news is that uh, locally here in the US, uh, driven by this trend, we're going to compete uh, with the manufacturers which are located in other parts of the world as well. Right? And here's a story. Uh, in one of our terminals uh, in DHL, we have a operations manager and he as a hobby, uh, he uh, uh, composes songs and uh, writes um, uh, country music on his guitar. Uh, he doesn't do it professionally, he just does it as a hobby and from time to time he would record a CD. Uh, and uh, when I was talking to him, he was very inspired by the fact that he would put the CD online and then someone from Asia uh, would buy his music and enjoy his music. And uh, that would have never been possible without e-commerce, uh, obviously, but it was also such an inspiration to him uh, just to keep going and keep producing uh, his music. So, uh, yeah, cross-border e-commerce is one of the top opportunities um, out there for businesses. The second uh, implication I want to talk about are the new uh, disruptive market entrance. So we know this word disruption, but here's a, here's a pretty interesting example. Dollar Shave Club. Um, I hope you've heard about this company. Uh, they manufacture razor blades. If you know anything about that industry, razor blades industry is 
a very conservative industry which was dominated for years uh, by two main manufacturers which is Gillette and, Schli and Schick uh, or also known as Wilkinson Swart in Europe and um, uh, it was very hard for other players to penetrate that industry. Uh, their strategy was mainly focused on uh, keep adding different features to laser blades such as uh, fifth or sixth blade uh, and make it uh, extra sharp uh, and keep prices up because of that. So the founder of Dollar Shave Club was actually frustrated by that strategy and by the trend and he just wanted to go back to basics and develop a product uh, which is uh, solid, uh, just does a job, uh, does a good job of shaving, but doesn't cost a lot of money. Uh, and um, so he uh, started um, the approach. He started first with posting a, a video on YouTube, which went viral. Uh, so he didn't have to spend a single dollar almost on on a marketing campaign. Uh, and then he started developing uh, this new brand, Dollar Shave Club, in the subscription direct to consumer model, right? Um, so this, this is an important application because uh, e-commerce really um, in the traditional supply chains uh, when we talk about um, uh, consumer goods, uh, there is always a retailer in between, in the middle. And uh, it will take you years to develop your retail channels if you want to come up with a new consumer uh, product, right? So you will have to convince Walmarts, you will have to convince uh, targets of this world to place your product. Um, this is not the case when you talk about e-commerce because here you have the opportunity to actually talk directly uh, to your consumer. So that was an unprecedented speed uh, for a company to scale up. Um, and uh, very quickly they uh, reached the mark of 3 million subscri subscribers. Uh, they were sold uh, for $1 billion uh, to Unilever. Uh, and um, that was just within five years, so unprecedented speed. Um, now, the argument is that uh, despite all this success, they still don't make up such a huge market share uh, in the razor business, and the question is, do they really present a huge threat to the uh, incumbents in that industry? Uh, well, here's one article from Wall Street Journal from uh, April last year, where basically, uh, um, Gillette admitted that they had to drop prices by 20% uh, driven by uh, Dollar Shave Club uh, and their competitors Harris as well, right? So basically uh, this companies, this new entrance, uh, new market entrance, uh, e-commerce first companies uh, going directly to consumer can pose a very significant threat uh, to existing businesses uh, and uh, can win the market share very quickly as well. The third trend uh, and the third implication for the business which I would like to talk about here is uh, the mass customization. So if you think about the product design, uh, for years the products were designed for an average consumer and the reason for this was because basically uh, to, to penetrate the mass, the mass market, right? Um, there was always demand for some specialized products uh, which uh, would have uh, different features modified, but it was very difficult uh, to find the consumers for this brand. So it was almost like uh, looking for a needle in a haystack. So now e-commerce actually, what it does, it enables you to find that needle in a haystack because uh, driven by the big data, even if you produce a very niche product, you still can find the consumer who will want to buy it. Uh, and to a certain degree, uh, e-commerce is actually bad news for commodities because commoditized products, um, uh, it, it's the race to the bottom, right? So for 100% commoditized products uh, in e-commerce, the only way to compete is through uh, the low price. But it, on the other hand, it gives the rise to very specialized brands uh, which cater to the needs of a certain uh, segment of um, consumers and build a local monopoly in that area. So here's just an example of Untucket, which is a very successful brand. So they identify the need um, to design shirts uh, which you can wear untucked. And um, they started uh, with just pure e-commerce approach and now they are pretty quickly rolling out uh, a network of uh, physical retail stores as well uh, in the malls. Um, and um, they're targeting a very specific niche of uh, consumers. Great success. And last but not least, uh, besides uh, you know all this good news that we mentioned uh, before, there are also some bad news. 
Um, a couple of years ago, Wall Street Journal came up with an article uh, basically claiming that despite um, all these huge opportunities that retail creates for, uh, that e-commerce creates for the retailers, many of them struggle to make money in that business. So according to this article, 80% of top retailers uh, admitted that e-commerce sales uh, were margin diluting uh, and actually they were lo they, they were costing them more uh, than the revenue of the product. Uh, the reason for this is mostly because um, a lot of retailers uh, historically when they were developing e-commerce business they were putting it on top of their existing uh, existing models. However, e-commerce has some additional cost components to them, such as the delivery, such as the returns, and the fulfillment price of single orders can also be more expensive than, than in the uh, traditional brick and mortar retail. So when you put this model on top um, of your uh, existing operations, um, that created some uh, profitability challenges, which were not necessarily noticed uh, when e-commerce was making up only a two, three, or four percent of their total business, but started hurting them really badly uh, when e-commerce um, sales have exceeded uh, 10 percent. And here's an example of, um, um, from my experience, I recently um, bought a guitar uh, in a store called Guitar Center. And um, to select the guitar, actually, I went to the store, uh, I tried a couple of guitars, and I was almost about to check it out. Um, at the location, so I, I had it in my hand, and I went to the uh, to the register, and then I I uh, wanted to look for something online, and I, I went to the Guitar Center website, and I noticed that they were actually given a 15% discount on that item if you buy it online. Uh, so what did I do? Of course, I just put it back to its place. Uh, I went back home, I placed an order online, and I got it delivered to that very same store. So from the Guitar Center perspective. Uh, it wasn't a very good transaction because uh, not only they gave me 15% discount on the retail price uh, in the store, but also they had shipping costs to get it delivered to that store with um, uh, with a shipping company, right? Uh, so this is an example of how these two approaches can be misaligned, uh, and um, which is creating the profitability challenges. And a lot of uh, um, a lot of solution uh, or a big portion of the solution to the profitability challenges of of um, the retail sector which is related to e-commerce actually lies in the supply chain space. So now let's talk about e-commerce supply chains. If there is one thing uh, that we all need to understand about uh, e-commerce supply chains and one thing that you should take out of this uh, webinar today, uh, it's the following. that uh, Delivery in e-commerce is part of consumer experience, right? So unlike the traditional uh, retail chains where supply chain runs somewhat in the background and you can only notice the supply chain in some extreme situations, for instance, if um, if you experience out of stock, uh, then you talk about you know supply chain disruption, right? But other than that, if everything is fine, uh, you as a consumer, you don't notice supply chain operations. So this is not the case for e-commerce, right? So e-commerce uh, contributes to the supply chain experience. And it's really important to understand consumer needs uh, to be successful in that area. So what are the some of the com consumer needs today? Speed, right? So we'll talk about speed a lot. Uh, 10 years ago, it was perfectly acceptable to get your order delivered within 10 days. Um, Amazon was uh, leading that um, uh, trend towards faster delivery times um, with a prime program. So right now the new norm is about three days uh, for all retailers and uh, it keeps shrinking. The second requirement is free. Uh, the shipping costs still remain the main reason for shopping cart abandonment at the checkout process. So the simple truth about the fact is that we as consumers don't like paying for the delivery. Uh, we want it for the price that is sold online and we don't want to pay extra charges to get it delivered to our house. So this by itself already creates a problem, right? So how on the one hand you get the speed um, to your consumer, but on the other hand, you still offer the free delivery option. And on top of that, you get some other requirements. So one, uh, the other emerging trend that we see is convenience. Um, it means that consumers actually want to choose when the product is going to be delivered to them at what time of the day, for instance, right? And they also want to be able to potentially choose 
the location where it's going to be delivered to. So instead of delivering to your house, they want to get it delivered to, to their office suddenly. Uh, and transparency. Track and trace has been a long-standing standard in the parcel delivery, delivery industry already for years, but right now consumers de demand already a new level of transparency. So they actually want to see in the real time where the driver is, and for some reason that they want to know that the uh, driver's name is Jack. So how to uh, solve this quest, how to provide all these features to consumers uh, and still be able to uh, meet the profitability targets. So the first trend uh, about supply chains that we're going to talk about is the decentralization. That is uh, sometimes a little bit counterintuitive um, in retail space uh, because the uh, uh, traditional retail is driven by, largely driven by the economies of scale, where the conventional wisdom, wisdom is that, you know, having one big facility is better than having many small facilities, right? Uh, in my past, uh, when I work as a supply chain consultant, a lot of our uh, consultant studies uh, would actually result in the uh, uh, warehouse footprint consolidation. This is not the case in e-commerce. Uh, and to understand this, um, uh, it is helpful sometimes to understand the history of Amazon. So if we look at Amazon um, back in 2010, uh, they operated 21 fulfillment centers, uh, and uh, usually one SKU would be offered only in one fulfillment center, and these fulfillment centers would deliver products nationally to the whole U.S. And uh, they were also located in tax optimal areas to take advantage of the sales tax optimization, right? Uh, but then in 2013, 2014, Amazon started a rapid expansion of the footprint, reaching uh, more than, I believe, 200 uh, fulfillment centers um, uh, at the moment uh, uh, in the US. And the big difference is that uh, products are shipped regionally in a very decentralized way. So you will find the same SKU in many, many, many fulfillment center locations in the US. So what changed? Why did Amazon change the approach? Well, this has something to do with the need for speed, uh, with the speed of delivery that Amazon was driving, right? So while if 10 days or 15 days um, delivery times is somewhat acceptable, maybe having one distribution center is still the right idea because of the economies of scale. But if you want to provide three-day or four-day delivery experience to your consumers, your last mile cost go through the roof very quickly. And it becomes much more um, um, cost-effective to actually decentralize your stock, uh, have a little bit more working capital, uh, but then save big time on the uh, uh, last mile transportation uh, by serving the demand locally. Uh, so at the moment, uh, we see many companies uh, adding uh, second or third uh, distribution locations. Obviously, we, we will not be able to replicate uh, the footprint that Amazon has, uh, but many companies are adding third or um, second or third um, uh, fulfillment center location in the U.S. to their existing footprint. Uh, and in the future, we see the game moving much more into the metro areas, where uh, huge metropolitan areas are going to have their own local DCS. If you are in the uh, uh, multi-channel, omni-channel space, uh, you can go even beyond. And the true kind of like uh, omni-channel supply chain uh, is the one which can use the inventory uh, at every step um, of the supply chain, right? So starting with a supplier, direct delivery to, to customer, which is uh, called the dropship model, and then uh, using obviously the uh, uh, distribution distribution center footprint, fulfillment center footprint. Ship from store is another uh, constantly growing trend uh, where you can uh, see uh, like the metro uh, demand being fulfilled out of local stores as well. One thing to note about it is uh, when you start decentralizing your supply chain model and start uh, try, try to utilize uh, the whole inventory which you have on your uh, system, things get very complex very soon because uh, instead of you know having just um, linear connection uh, from supplier to the distribution center to the store to consumer uh, you have multiple connection points uh, how the product can get to consumer but also how it can get to the store right so you need to have very sophisticated uh, system to be able to manage that complexity and we see a lot of um, uh, development happening right now in the area of distributed order management system. So to illustrate you how it works, 
it's all about real-time decision making. So for instance, if we have a customer in Boston who wants to buy a shirt, so he selected a certain shirt online, right? This order goes into the system where the system checks the availability of that particular shirt in the network in all the possible nodes, which would include uh, warehouses and stores. Um, then the next step will be the order allocation. And um, allocation is happening on a number of rules um, and distance to the consumer does not necessarily have to be the main rule um, to define how the order is allocated. Um, so as an example, um, um, I know a company uh, which for instance would check first uh, in the warehouses if um, uh, this pro product is not available in the warehouse is gonna go and check it in stores and then it's gonna check first uh, in kind of like the rural stores uh, and if that product is not available in the rural stores it will move on and check in our flagman stores and the uh, logic behind is that um, they want to be able to uh, uh, channel to the flagman stores only the orders um, which um, you cannot find anywhere else because uh, the idea is that the flagman stores uh, employees should uh, utilize their time on different purposes, uh, such as you know serving customers who come to the stores, providing the best in-store experience, and they want to have least destruction on the labor in the flagman stores uh, when it comes to the e-commerce order fulfillment. But they use, they will use that store location as a last resort option for e-commerce order fulfillment, right? So after that, uh, the order gets allocated to a certain node. Uh, let's say this time it got allocated to Los Angeles and then uh, that's where the order is picked and packed and delivered, right? So basically uh, this order, uh, the, the, the objective of this distributed order management system is to optimize the uh, total cost to serve individual order, which doesn't have to be necessarily just the shipping cost, which in this case would be uh, higher, right? Than serving it locally. Uh, one technology that I would like to point out here is RFID. Uh, it's a technology which made a quiet comeback uh, in the um, uh, last couple of years. Uh, it started uh, in early 2000 and it was almost completely written off because uh, the RFID uh, chip was so expensive that it was super hard to get a business case to implement that. Uh, so we've seen recently uh, um, a lot of chains, for instance Zara, uh, have very successfully implemented um, RFID technology uh, on an item level. Of course, the price of a chip went down, but this entire omni-channel trend creates a new opportunity for this technology to be used, right? So they, they tag RFID to each item in the store, which enables them uh, on one hand to keep only one size of one SKU in the store present, and they will always know when this product was sold, so they have to put it back on the shelf from the back room. On the other hand, for instance, it has some other implications um, which are less obvious, such as inventory count. So right now they can do, um, they, they used to uh, spend hours on doing the inventory count in the stores. Right now it's 100% visible in the store through the IT system and they don't have to spend any time on the inventory count uh, in the store. They can also use these devices to locate products in the store if they cannot find a certain size of a shirt. Uh, the next um, thing I would like to point out about uh, um, implications of um, e-commerce um, uh, supply chain is the uh, decentralization enables the access to a different set of players. So it's kind of like a side uh, side effect of decentralization, right? Uh, because when we have only one warehouse for the um, uh, delivery of e-commerce orders, uh, pretty much our only option is to use uh, the well-known national carriers who can do it nationwide. But if you go to regional or even local uh, footprint in the metro areas, that opens up a space for completely new set of players such as the regional carriers or even um, uh, crowdsourced, crowdsourced technologies or local couriers uh, in the big metro areas, which sometimes provide uh, service even better than uh, the national players. Um, but also at a better price point. Uh, to manage the complexity uh, and to go multi-carrier, uh, which is another step that, that uh, e-commerce companies have to go through, uh, you obviously need also a transport management system. 
Um, there is a number of vendors which are offering the solution, but the idea is very similar to the distributed order management system that the uh, transportation purchasing decision is actually happening real time. Once the order is received, based on the order characteristics, it will find the best shipping option, uh, which would minimize uh, cost and transit time and um, in real time uh, decide uh, which, which carrier to use and which route to go through. Talking about last mile, um, in the supply chain would be incomplete if we don't mention the innovation uh, which is going into this area. A lot of venture capital money uh, is being pumped into uh, coming up with new creative uh, technologies uh, in the last mile. So one example is the, uh, or the word that is used as the uberization of last mile. Uh, that's also space where we, uh, as DHL e-commerce uh, in the US, uh, have our own product offering as well called, called Parcel Metro. Um, the um, idea here is to orchestrate a number of um, uh, courier companies and also crowdsourced options um, on the um, uh, local level to find the best the best solution. Uh, but the important thing to understand, um, we all know what is Uber, right? So the important thing to understand here is uh, that it's not all about price. Uh, a lot of it is about consumer experience. So remember that consumer experience is part of e-commerce shopping experience, right? And um, uh, after Uber entered uh, the uh, cab market, um, a lot of companies, uh, cab companies actually dropped their prices as well to match Uber, but many people still use Uber even if it's the same price or even sometimes more expensive than using a cab company. Why they do it? Well, because Uber provides this um, just better consumer experience for them, right? So Parcel Metro uh, and this entire um, last mile technology uh, Uberization uh, is uh, to a large degree, degree really about the consumer experience. Then there is a couple of other innovations um, happening uh, in the last mile space, such as trunk delivery, right? We're running an experiment uh, in Germany. Uh, this is where you can install a a device uh, into your trunk uh, and you can use uh, the trunk of your car as a potential delivery location, right? So while you are at work, uh, a courier can come and drop off a package in your trunk instead of delivering to the doorstep of your house, which can be potentially uh, even more secure than uh, deliver, delivering it, leaving it at the doorstep. Uh, drones is um, uh, another uh, can you see my screen still? So I have some pop-up, I hope. So drones is another technology that is um, uh, being uh, looked after at the moment. And um, I don't think that there will be a very quick adoption at the full scale. So we're gonna see drones you know, flying in the big cities uh, very soon, but it definitely has some cool use cases when it comes to the rural areas. So in this picture, for instance, is um, sorry. Yeah. Um, on, on this picture, you can see a, a parcel copter. So that's a new technology that DHL is experiencing in um, DHL is trying in Germany, uh, where they combine the technology of a parcel locker and a drone delivery, completely unmanned, unattended uh, delivery system, um, and um, uh, provides very good access to. Uh, um, consumers um, who are located in the rural areas. Sorry, I have to ask a question to the uh, moderators. Sorry, Dimitri, we've got a quick technical um, change oh. here. We're going to go ahead and run the presentation uh, from our end, but go ahead and keep speaking. Okay, all right, thank you. Yep. Um, right, so. Uh, I think we can uh, uh, move, move over to the next slide. I, I can control it, okay, perfect. Yeah, so the um, um, the other technology is the delivery robots, right? So if you've been to, I think, Washington DC, um, they have a pilot uh, of running similar delivery platforms. So these are the robots which you can dispatch from the uh, fulfillment center and um, it's self driving robots uh, which can deliver the package to the doorstep of your house. So there's a lot of, uh, the bottom line here is that when it comes to the last mile, um, there is a lot of new technology really being tried right now, um, not yet 
the industry came up with a dominant solution, uh, which will be uh, rolled out at a mass scale. But there is a re really a lot of new and exciting stuff happening there with the main objective of um, further improving the customer experience and helping to reduce cost of uh, last mile delivery in the supply chain. And uh, with that, uh, just a couple of concluding remarks about what comes next, right? Uh, so as you remember, we started with this uh, wave chart showing uh, where do we see the e-commerce right now uh, and um, uh, what is going to happen in the future. Well, uh, no one can really predict the future, but uh, it's very likely that we're going to see the e-commerce continue growing at a very fast pace. Um, important thing here is that um, basically it's not just one curve but it's it's uh, several curves uh, when you stack them together on top of each other and each time a new technological development gave another boost to um, e-commerce development uh, it's likely that we're going to see you know influence of artificial intelligence virtual reality robotics given uh, basically uh, putting e-commerce at another growth curve and um, um, accelerating the growth uh, yet again. Now the question is how do businesses, how should businesses react? Um, can we go to the next page please? Yeah. How should businesses um, react to this, right? And uh, a couple of lessons learned uh, that we uh, have found uh, by working with companies who are trying to go through this transformation, right, and adopt um, this B2B uh, to more this B2C space. Uh, their supply chain models, but also businesses. Uh, so the first one is the concept of sunk cost, right? Um, a lot of it has to do with uh, about IT systems. Um, recently, uh, uh, companies made huge investments into IT platforms, um, which are uh, which had a lot of cost, uh, but are just simply not enough for the new e-commerce uh, uh, direct-to-consumer world, right? And uh, the important uh, thing here is not to get stuck in the past decisions and kind of like trying to stay the course uh, but rethink it rethink those decisions even this investments were massive you still need to think ahead and uh, if the models are not fit anymore for the future the way it's shaping up uh, new investments need to be made uh, the second um, lesson learned here is um, uh, some wise man told me um, that if you think five minutes uh, if you think five years ahead of everybody you're a lunatic if you think uh, five minutes ahead of everybody you're a genius right so here's an example or a, or a picture of a company called webvan uh, you may have heard that it was a, uh, a company uh, in early 2000 who came up with this idea of uh, home grocery delivery uh, right now you would think great idea no-brainer everybody does it everybody makes ton of money with it right but they they failed and um, the main reason why they failed is just because they were so far ahead of um, the industry uh, with their idea. So the market was just not ready yet. So uh, the lesson learned here is that don't jump, don't jump too fast, too far, but kind of like stay in touch with the reality and uh, rather take the uh, trial and error approach. So that's kind of like the next lesson learned is. Um, on the, on the step three, what's important in this um, e-commerce reality is uh, this lean startup uh, mindset, right? Which is basically, if you've read the book uh, from Eric Ries about lean startup mentality, uh, uh, he argues that it's not about the idea, but it's about the implementation of the idea, right? And to implement the idea successfully, um, you need to find a way to learn and test your hypothesis quickly and fail quickly as well uh, so that you don't set off yourself to a long to a wrong long-term path which is not going to lead you anywhere right so adopting clean startup mentality in large uh, companies is a is a very important thing um, in this dynamic environment uh, such as e-commerce uh, number four share the risk uh, partners so one of the interesting trends uh, which, which is good for us um, as a dhl obviously is that um, the um, um, outsourcing becomes much more attractive in the e-commerce world, right? So when uh, when we talk about um, uh, traditional retail uh, chains, uh, very often the dedicated facilities win uh, because you customize them to your own operation and you have enough economies of scale. But if you want to decentralize your inventory, 
um, it's actually better from the cost perspective to share it with other players as well, right? Uh, so there are partners out there who can uh, help you go through this transformation, such as 3PLs, and uh, you don't have to go uh, alone uh, into this uh, transformational journey, but you can count on your partners as well. And last but not least, um, number five is, um, uh, you kind of like have to pick your strategy really uh, because one strategy when you see this e-commerce uh, shift happening uh, to the business models you can sit and wait and this is also by the way a valid strategy right so you will avoid um, avoid costly investments and uh, you can uh, later on adapt your approach to what you have learned uh, from other companies but that kind of like puts you in the position to catch up and the question is whether you would be able to catch up soon, soon enough um, with that, uh, I would like to conclude my presentation for today. Um, again, very exciting topic. Uh, we see a lot of things happening very rapidly in that area, uh, and I'm open for questions. Very good. Uh, thank you very much, Dimitri. Uh, great content. Um, so we'd like to go ahead and give the audience a chance to ask questions. Uh, as a reminder, please click on the Q&A tab on the right side of your screen, enter your question, and click Ask. Uh, we'll uh, just a, a minute for a few questions to come in. Um, but I will start uh, as we do that, uh, Dimitri. Uh, what, what is specifically DHL doing to support retailers and, and manufacturing uh, manufacturers in their e-commerce needs? Right, yeah. So uh, we do a, a number of steps um, uh, which basically um, address uh, these challenges that, that I described in our presentation, right? Uh, this uh, trend towards the decentralization or regionalization was started building out a couple of years ago a network of fulfillment centers in different um, areas of the U.S., uh, which are plug-and-play uh, facilities, which you can basically um, uh, plug into your existing inventory management system and, um, and use them as um, other fulfillment nodes. Uh, we are also experimenting um, uh, with the last mile with this parcel metro solution where we are offering uh, same day uh, delivery services and it's a technology first approach. Uh, and with our core domestic, we basically are trying to make our uh, B2C delivery uh, faster and cheaper on a daily basis to cater to the needs of e-commerce players. Sorry about that. Uh, so, follow-up question then uh, would be, Dimitri, using the Uber approach for deliveries, as Amazon has recently announced, um, what other disruptions are you seeing in the transportation arena? Um, uh, really, a lot is technology, right? And technology, uh, you can split into two areas. Um, uh, one of them is... Um, uh, about orchestration, so that's uh, what this Uberization is about, right? It's connecting multiple providers into one system and um, making sure that capacities are distributed in the optimal way uh, within the system. But then technology, when it comes to, uh, uh, for instance, order fulfillment within warehouses, you probably have seen this uh, Alibaba warehouses or also Amazon warehouses, uh, that they are fully automated systems uh, when it comes to the order fulfillment, right? Uh, so robotics in the warehouses, augmented uh, reality uh, for picking and uh, things like that. Uh, and then the third bucket uh, of disruptive technology is um, uh, really the uh, uh, last mile. Uh, the uh, robotics in the last mile, so the unmanned delivery is uh, definitely a trend. I think uh, uh, companies didn't figure out the operating model as of yet. Uh, but it will come at some time point, and I think that um, the unmanned delivery is gonna is gonna be growing as a as a thing in the years Great. to come. Great. Um, next question: What is the level of demand forecast inaccuracy currently in e-commerce, and how does it impact key parameters of cost, speed, and reliability? That's a great question, yeah. So, of course, um, uh, your ability to optimize uh, the uh, working capital if you decentralize is going to be uh, directly correlated uh, with the uh, demand forecast accuracy. I don't have the exact numbers, and, um, and uh, even if I would give you a number, it probably would be misleading because each retailer uh, um, has a different level and uh, probably each SKU also has a different level, uh, but that's where this big data approach, that this is one of the main challenges for, for 
the decentralization um, of the inventory, but it's also uh, an area where a lot of uh, investment is happening at the moment uh, with the machine learning algorithms, right, which uh, plug in into your inventory management systems and are coming up with a better uh, forecast. Um, and a good example of this is, is uh, um, of use, uh, what I presented um, uh, early on in the presentation is Nike Store, right, where they use their online sales data to actually forecast uh, what SKUs will be demanded in a certain geographical area in their physical stores as well, right? So I think it's a very, very brilliant approach to uh, to solving that problem. So the big data is, is an area, and I'm sure that we're going to see uh, um, demand forecast improving in the last couple of years. Great. Um, next up, Dimitri, do you think uh, e-commerce uh, will be, or, or maybe how uh, relevant is the better question to healthcare in the in the near future? Um, so we are seeing uh, trends towards healthcare. So in fact, um, we as DHL, uh, our top customer uh, is actually uh, in as DHL e-commerce in the US is a healthcare player as well. Um, and um, um, it, it's not it, it's not the industry which is which has uh, at the moment the highest uh, penetration rate, uh, but there will be definitely some use cases. So I believe that the cameras can be relevant, for instance, first for some specialty drugs, uh, because uh, those are uh, difficult to uh, push to pharmacists, right? It just doesn't make sense. So that's probably going to be an area which is going to see the adoption uh, first. Um, but then it's going to be spreading out more and more uh, driven by online pharmacies and uh, ability to do the online prescription of products. Um, Great. Um, thank you very much, Dimitri. And unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions today. Uh, we do, again, want to thank Dimitri for taking the time to be here and for sharing these great insights. Um, we do hope everyone uh, in our audience today will uh, join us at APEX 2018 in Chicago from September 30th through October 2nd. It's another can't-miss event featuring new topics, dynamic speakers, and plenty of opportunities uh, to expand your professional network. And as an added bonus, attendees of today's webinar are, will receive a special discount offer, as you can see on your screen, which allows you to save an additional $100 on your full conference registration uh, when you use code CHWEB100. And this can actually be applied with our already discounted registration pricing that runs through July 31st of this year. Uh, visit apexconference.org for more information and to register. Uh, this concludes today's Apex online event. Thank you for participating. All content and materials included in this APEX online event are the property of APEX and are protected by the United States and international copyright laws. All rights are reserved. <laughs>